In the fall of 2016, the Wayne Art Center hosted two simultaneous exhibitions about the human figure. The depiction of undressed people raises many questions in the public imagination, questions these shows hoped to address. The theme of the nude is a fraught one sometimes in contemporary critical discourse because of political perspectives on the human body, whether it's a feminist perspective or a queer perspective. There are folks with strong right-wing views that are interested in the body as an icon for a certain kind of an order. And in doing this show, we were hoping that it would be an occasion for a lot of conversation about what the nude means to people and whether it still has a real relevance in people's lives as an act of painting. Having gone to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts at the age of 18 and being uh, immersed in the art world at such a young age, I hang nudes in my own house without thinking twice, entirely forgetting that people who come into the house, guests, may not be used to that. Uh, and even my own wife and daughter at times have told me I've got to cut back on the number of nudes hanging in the house. Scott Noel and Paul Dussold are two prominent representational painters who organize these shows. The nude, Mirror of Desire, features their work along with that of Margaret McCann and the late Ben Kamahira, as well as some other artists that they admire. Paul and Scott also selected works for the nude figure, a juried fine art exhibition. We'll come back to that show in a little bit, but first, let's look at the artists in The Nude, Mirror of Desire. My understanding was largely come to by reading Kenneth Clark's book, The Nude, where he points out the nude is not nakedness, and that nakedness in and of itself is not beautiful or meaningful that the nude as a subject of art is really a concept in which a kind of idealization is discovered through the order of the human body. Since I was a student, I always felt that painting the nude figure was the most serious subject and where I would want to go, if not right away, eventually. In the beginning, I was influenced by some old master paintings, specifically Venetian painting and Titian. I was also greatly influenced by my mentor, Arthur da Costa. It was only after I graduated from the academy that I began visiting Arthur in his studio and seeing the many, many figurative compositions that he had there and feeling that those nudes of Arthur's were speaking to me in a way as if I was discovering my own personal aesthetic identity, a relationship of man to his surroundings, and this was a kind of relationship of figure to landscape that was not realistic, certainly was not naturalistic, and there was the rub, how to place a figure in a landscape, describe them both credibly, and yet not have an effect that would seem awkward or silly naked people out in a landscape. And what I realized over time in all of these failed attempts at pursuing that, what I was in fact after was something more metaphorical, similar to the effect one would see in archaic Greek sculpture. Something that certainly resembles the subject matter and yet distilled down to an aesthetic essence which has a greater profundity to it, at least to my aesthetic sensibilities. For years, I painted still lives where the subject matter was set in a kind of dark void. This was due to my influences, the paintings historically that I emulated. More recently, I have started to place the nude figure in a similar background. I had the realization that dark background was a metaphor for time and that the figure represents the ephemerality of form and life within that 
eternity. Your paintings have titles that allude to Greek myths, is that correct? Yes, although the title is not where I begin, I don't want the titles to create any sort of narrative effect in the viewer's mind. There really isn't a story involved, but like mythology, they are metaphorical and they act as a finger pointing to a profounder mystery. In one of your paintings, a male figure is gazing down at a nude female figure. Actually, they're both nude. Are you concerned at all about portraying the male gaze as kind of a sexual thing? No, I think that's got to be part of it. Eros is part of the human experience, but it is not the purpose in the painting. And the female figure is an expression of the majesty of beauty. If Paul Dussold is a classicist with a reverence for Sir Kenneth Clark, then Margaret McCann is decidedly more postmodern. But she too takes inspiration from the art of the ancient world. I talked to her by phone and recorded our conversation. I started doing giant figures when I lived in Rome. I went there in 1985, I had a Fulbright, and then I wound up lingering there eight years. I was directly inspired by a class I taught at Trinity College called Drawing Monuments. So I took the students to the Colosseum, the Tempietto, and we drew them. And then I would give my students assignments like draw an object as a monument. And then I started doing my own homework assignments. I had some plaster casts and started putting them in still life. And then eventually I replaced it with models. So at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, when painting the figure was really out of fashion, I've been doing it on and off since then. Very influenced by De Chirico, but also by the idea of temporal and spatial dislocations that you see when walking through the train station in Rome, and there's a, a piece of a Roman wall that they've just built around, suddenly going way back in time. Every day sublime experiences. It's what's so wonderful about Rome. Everyone's seen that poster, the attack of the 50-foot woman. She's standing, looking very dangerous in her bikini. But you have your models reclining. So there's a passivity, and yet they could get up and just start wrecking stuff. Which they do, actually, after when I, when I leave the studio. That's why when I come back and I stay the studio's a mess. It wasn't me. <laughs> I did do a painting called The 50-Foot Woman, 1989. That was one of my first ones, actually. So I was influenced by that. But it was really more when I took my students to draw pieces of the statue of Constantine in the forum. There would be a foot there. So, you know, you call it Bigfoot. And then there was Constantine's finger. And then his head also. They were very goofy looking. And really, the first thing they reminded me of were Klaus Holdenberg sculptures. And I just realized how American I was, that I was thinking of the most pop reference. That was my archetype. Uh, I guess I'm saying something about powerfulness and powerlessness, but a lot of the reason that I have them reclining is simply because I like the model to be comfortable and because I really enjoy foreshortened poses. Margaret told me that the paintings start with a general idea, but are changed a lot during the process. The constructed quality of her compositions and the piling up of foreshortened forms reflect her love of cubism. So yeah, I'm much more, I suppose, modern in my method than the other painters in the show. Is there a different experience for a woman painting a nude woman than there is for a man? Well, I think, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, you can identify anatomically how a pose would feel or all those kinds of things. So there's a natural kind of empathy. And by the way, I have painted men. Even for women to paint the nude in the 90s was verboten, like it was still politically incorrect, because in a way you were complicit in this whole idea of the exploitative male gaze. Nowadays, that's much more in keeping with what's going on in the art world, but in the 90s it was a big problem. Even if you were a woman and you were painting women looking powerful, that was still suspect. I think it probably took Lucian Freud and then Jenny Savile to break through that taboo. There's still probably some of that, especially if your painting style is maybe more neoclassical and you're still painting women in a more objectified way, like the ideal nude rather than a person. I think in my case, they're quite stylized. and There's some abstract things that are going on, more about color. So it's probably less of a burden for me to do that. 
the English art critic John Berger had just died, so I asked Margaret about one of his quotes. He said, men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. One of the challenges for women is to not be the desired object, but to be the desiring subject. Also, to gaze at what you wish to gaze at. Painting the figure over years and years, I do think that women are more beautiful, <laughs> just as abstract shapes. I like to paint both men and women, but it's easier to find a more lyrical vision with the female form than the men form. So I don't think that will ever completely go away, that the girls are prettier and aware and more self-conscious about it. All three of the other painters are looking at the female erotically in a way. I'm more identifying with her in a first-person way. So I think I paint them more as thinking, contemplative beings. They don't really seem to be aware that they're being looked at. <laughs> the humor in your paintings, is that something you consciously are working towards or just your sensibility? Well, I'm glad you saw it. I, mean, I say that I have Irish Tourette's. You know, it's very hard for me to not make jokes. So, um, <laughs> I like something deep and something absurd where those two meet. I'm Scott Noel, and uh, I'm one of the co-curators of this exhibition, and I'm a teacher of painting and drawing at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I would say I'm an observational painter, a painter that paints what he sees, but I use that practice to make contact with feelings that great painting has awakened in me, a love of the world that painting makes evident physicality, space, light, texture, the beauties of skin and objects. And my work is mostly about the place that these somewhat innocent drives to know a space, to know a person. The strange place that I get delivered to when I make a painting about those things. Scott, you appear to have dog hair on you. Yes. The dog is the successor for that beautiful creature up there. My first great canine model was my wife's and my dog, Ginger, who's in this painting. And the hair on my t-shirt right now belongs to another Siberian husky named Courtney. Are dogs good models? They can be. The husky in this painting had to be continuously bribed with dog biscuits to turn its head towards the pillows on the bed. It wasn't her interest in the models, it was the prospect of concealed food that made her a good model. So Ginger and Courtney have been two of my most important muses over the last 18 years. They are always reminders of my animal self. Any work of art that originates in a love or an investigation of the world generates commitments that you might not have imagined beforehand. If you have an adolescent attraction to a woman's body, if you realize that to do justice to that body, you'd have to learn all the intricacies of anatomy, all the contingencies of an appearance, all the life of a light and a space in which that body unfolded, you might wind up with a very different desire from the one with which you began. I've gotten in the last three or four years very interested in placing figures in the cast hall at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. It started to seem what I've called a core sample of two and a half millennia of stylized desire. When I'm looking at the David or the friezes from the Parthenon or Rodin's Age of Bronze, I'm really aware of those sculptures as being icons of their cultural moment, but also very human and very living reflections of the desire and emotion of the men that made them. Since my temperament is very inclined towards connection and a solidarity with the past, Putting a figure in the cast hall seemed to me a form of expressing my own sense of solidarity with that past and trying to escape something that I really dislike in traditional art, which is the experience of nostalgia. Now, I understand nostalgia is an authentic emotion, but that often gets tangled up with a certain kind of complacent sentimentality, which I detest.
And when you're in the cast hall, the last thing you feel is sentimentality. You feel urgency. You feel a passion that's still there as hot as it burned when the things were made. So in going into a very prestigious place like the cast hall, part of it is for me a test of my own commitment to the ongoing life of these forms, which I hope will not die, but that's not assured. To me, it's almost like a vanitas. You see this incredibly beautiful young woman surrounded by casts. Her body will not stay like that for long, and she will die. And yet these Greek sculptures have been around for thousands of years. There's a way in which you can frame that in a morbid way, and there's a way in which you could say that the glory of those fleeting bodies can't be surpassed by any work of art. When I put one of those beautiful figures in that cast hall, I think they hold their own pretty well. And even though they're fragile and fleeting, as Rilke would say, einmal and nicht mehr, once and no more. That quality of the fleeting human body is about as moving as anything I can think of. The fourth member of the Mirror of Desire show truly lives up to that name. Ben Kamahira died in 2004 after a long career as one of the most skillful American figurative painters of the past half century. I had Ben as a teacher at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and have always deeply admired his work. Some of the paintings that I'm going to show you were not in the Wayne Show. Ben painted still lives and landscapes but he had a special affinity for atmospheric and dreamlike images of women that were infused with eroticism. This probably did hurt him in the art world, but I would argue that he did not objectify women as much as portray a longing that he had for the beauty to be found in this world. a beauty that obsessed him. His facility with paint and rough eloquence with a brush show him seeking, but perhaps never finding, a complete union with this beauty. The great honor for us in this show is getting to show seven of Ben Kamihira's paintings from his estate owned by his daughter Tomi Kamihira, who is very, very generously allowed us to show these paintings. Ben's been a little bit off the radar in the art world since his passing, and we really hope to do a little bit of reintroduction of his achievement in this show. And we found at least four or five of the paintings in this show were left unfinished in his studio at his passing. When I saw those paintings, I was struck by what a poet Kamihira had been. I was aware of how much Kamihira poetically evolved his images out of strange meetings of forms. His paintings are very much about a sense of becoming. They're hardly ever what I would call final. They make analogies between different kinds of forms that routes his sensuousness, his eroticism, into unexpected places. Like, there's very few people that could paint as sexually charged a couch as Ben Kamehara can. All along, in thinking about his work for many, many years, I thought that his reputation and his persona as a romantic, libidinous artist concealed something deep about his achievement, which was its strange openness to the erotic quality of almost everything you could look at if you looked at the everything with a level of love that he did. There's something so beautiful about the way Ben painted. Let's just take a minute and gaze in wonder.
the figure creates these strange communities across geographical and even chronological space. Another delight of the show has been the privilege of getting to show the work of Leonard Anderson. Leonard Anderson died exactly a year ago. His daughter, Jeanette, very graciously loaned us this nude early to middle 1960s. Looks to me like a one-shot or a la prima painting. Leonard, like Kamihira, one of those artists that has an immense following among painters who work with the figure. Two of my far-flung comrades are Mark Green and Frank Galuska, who have both shown extensively in Philadelphia but do not presently live here. I would say that for myself, they are a big part of the visual culture that has shaped me. Now it's time to look at the jury show, which was hand-picked by our connoisseurs of the art nude, Scott and Paul. The Art Center had sent out a prospectus nationally, and the submissions were 400 in number. We juried the show online, of course, because the submissions were electronic. We were thrilled to see the submissions in real life because they were so much more impressive than they were through the electronic images. The handling, the professionalism, degree of sensitivity and skill, I think has made for a very impressive, high-level juried show. And there's some pretty high-profile people. We were stunned. Bo Bartlett, one of the most admired and successful painters of the figure in the country right now, submitted a work for the show. He actually came to the opening. He certainly didn't need to do this show, and I think he did it partly as a gesture of solidarity with all these people who care so much about this activity. You can find this nifty online catalog on the Wayne Art Center website. When my buddy Jimmy Bugar heard I was doing this movie, he demanded that I let him ask a question that he was sure is on everybody's mind. Okay, Jimmy, fire away. <laughs> I tell you what, if I could get a job sitting around painting naked ladies all day, I'd be in heaven. What's it like, Mr. Dusold? The first time you draw one of them nudes, the first time I was in the presence of a nude model, I was 17 years old. I had never had a girlfriend. And I saw a woman walking around in a bathrobe. I started trembling internally, just trembling. And I thought, I'm going to embarrass myself. I won't be able to work. I won't be able to draw. I was fairly surprised at myself that the moment the robe was dropped, I was fully engaged, just drawing. was not an erotic experience in the least. It was a completely satisfying artistic experience. I was surrounded by artists who were drawing from this model. And I felt I was part of their company and pursuing that same thing that they were, although with far less skill. It was a beautiful experience, but not an erotic one. Jimmy, that was a really good question. Did Mr. Dussault's answer make any sense to you? Yes, sir.
When I see all them beautiful pictures, it really ain't like them girly calendars we got at the shop at all. I reckon drawing and painting people without the clothes is a pretty important thing. Them people got lives and ideas and whatnot. It ain't just about us viewers getting all stirred up. There's a lot more to it. Although in fairness to getting stirred, in that book you made me read, John Berger said, to be desired is perhaps the closest anybody in this life can reach to feeling immortal. Anyhow, them Wayne nude shows was damn good, and I hope your movie keeps them in the people's memory. <laughs>